You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Thanks for tuning in to Mining Stock Education. I am your host, Bill Powers, and you are in for a treat today. You will be hearing from a very seasoned and successful strategic mining investor, uh, Dave Lotan, and uh, you're going to be hearing about his backstory, how he came into junior resources. He uh, invests with a lot of the big players in the industry and has a lot of knowledge to share. I was introduced to Dave over email several months ago, but only had the opportunity to talk to him through the virtual Beaver Creek conference a couple weeks ago. And I was most impressed with uh, just his no nonsense approach to the sector as we were chatting for about 25 minutes. So I asked if he would come on the show to share some of his insights with you and he graciously obliged. So Dave, welcome to the show for the first time. Hey Bill, thanks for having me on. Let's start with your backdrop. Uh, You come from the finance sector. You were a CPA or have a CFA degree, I should say. Uh, Share a little bit about your backdrop and how did you get to this place to where you're now investing in mining stocks? Sure, sure. Well, long before I was a CA, as we call it in Canada, or CPA, uh, I I was investing uh, in university and in juniors. Uh, My father was a passionate investor and I grew up in a house full of annual reports stacked all over tables and, uh, and furniture. And, um, once, once I uh, graduated from university and went to work at, at Price Waterhouse, um, through sort of a random series of coincidences, I ended up working, uh, in derivatives and structured finance. And one of the big clients of the firm at the time was, um, was Barrick and Barrick had a very, uh, a very notorious hedging program on at the time. Uh, they had these spot deferred gold contracts, uh, which were uh, run through an offshore entity, I think maybe in Cayman. And while the gold price had been declining, Barrick, which was uh, the juggernaut in in uh, in gold producers at the time, was making excellent money, and and it was viewed as being a really, you know, uh, innovative approach to business. Um, and uh, there were many other companies that were beginning to follow in, in, in Barrick's uh, footsteps. Um, and hedging and, and using commodity contracts, uh, had the usage of those things had been increasing over time uh, across the spectrum of, spectrum of commodity producers. So I spent a lot of time in that um, and uh, wasn't really investing in junior mining at the time. You don't really get paid that much as a CPA. Uh, and I left the business uh, in 1999, started uh, running a mortgage banking business for a hedge fund, which was also using leveraged products, uh, interest rate swaps uh, and options and those sorts of things. Um, and, uh, and then uh, in 2003, started my own business uh, using, again, structured finance techniques and leverage techniques to, to amplify returns. I sold that business to a bank and 2007. And so, uh, while I, I was away from the commodities markets during most of that period, I continued to work in businesses that were using tremendous amounts of financial leverage to amplify returns. And, and uh, with some wealth uh, and, uh, and some dilemmas, frankly, because the financial crisis happened in 07, 08, I started to think about uh, leverage and the destructiveness that it had wrought on the global investing, uh, on, on the global investing world and, and, and how to, how to source it in ways that were less dangerous and potentially, um, and potentially, uh, less mainstream. And so leverage returns, uh, are, a leverage investment is is considered leverage because you borrow a bunch of money against a small amount of capital put down with the objective of making a multiple of, of your capital. And there are many ways to create leverage that aren't that don't involve borrowing money. Uh, on on uh, you, you can invest in a bank which is borrowing a lot of money on its capital and potentially get a fantastic return a fantastic return based on borrowed money. Uh, at the corporate level, you can invest in an insurance company, as Warren Buffett did with Geico, for instance. They borrow their money f- on on very good terms, 
um, in the form of what they call float. They get paid premiums. They don't pay at those premiums for long periods of time and often never. In the meantime, those, those premiums are invested in, uh, in, in bonds and stocks. And uh, when I looked at junior resources, which is a sector that I had, had been interested in in the 1990s during the Diamond Fields run and Arequipa and even Briex, I thought, well, you know, there's 10x, 20x, 100x available in that class of investing as well. And, and so uh, in, that, in that case, you're sourcing leverage uh, through psychology, through flow, through a variety of, of mechanisms that are that are uh, fragile and often and often in, in, interrupted, and uh, and I thought to myself that this was probably uh, an interesting place to focus. Junior resource stocks, in my view, are long dated call options, and the duration of those options is unknown and can be extended by good management. And, uh, and by a change in commodity prices or a change in investor psychology. And uh, so it was probably 2011 when the, the TSX venture began to sell off. And, and uh, I think it was down by half. And I thought, well, this is probably an interesting place to start uh, looking at, 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 uh, at these, these little companies uh, for return. Is that when you first bought your first mining stock, Dave? No, no, I, 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 I've been in the sector for, for many years, but, uh, not with, uh, not with millions of dollars. Uh, and, uh, and so 2011, I started allocating capital quite heavily to the business. As I said to Corey and Shad only about four years too early. Um, but I scaled in, uh, and, uh, like a lot of investors, it, you know, wasn't clear to me, uh, how far that market could fall. Um, but luckily in 2015, when it was reaching its ultimate bottom, I still had lots of capital available. I, I wasn't sure about the wisdom of putting more capital into the market at that point in time, but you looked around you and you looked at the value of the venture uh, and it was probably at a 50 year low. And, and uh, you thought about how miserable and humiliating it was to have invested in these stocks. And it seemed to me that that was an obvious sign that you needed to put more money in counterintuitive, but so you were a portfolio manager for a pension fund. So you, this Correct. is not pension fund type investing. So I, when I was looking at no. your bio, I was kind of wondering how those t two things went together. Did you have to just put on a different alter ego to <laughs> run a pension fund versus speculating in a small mid, small cap mining no, stock? No, no. The, the business uh, that, that I had, um, the business uh, that I started in 2004 uh, and sold to one of the big Canadian banks was a structured finance business that, uh, to simplify it, took advantage of a of a credit arbitrage between Canadian standards and global standards. And uh, I started that business, got it up and running and profitable, and sold it very quickly. I had a good friend at that pension fund who was attempting to start a similar business but much larger. And uh, I went to teachers to uh, to assist him in uh in building that business only at about 10 times the size of the one that i had built and sold and uh the the uh, structured finance markets collapsed that year it was the beginning of the mortgage crisis in the united states so i stayed around for about a year and uh and we did some work uh in distressed investing but it was way way too early for that uh you'll you'll never make money in the early stages of, of a massive decline or the total destruction of an asset class like that, uh, usually you need to let uh, you need to let some some form of price discovery occur. So uh, by August of '08, it was obvious to me that uh, I couldn't manage their money and manage my own at the same time. I think I'd lost about thirty percent of my net worth, and I thought, well, I'm going to leave and, and manage my own my own dough. So. Uh, so uh, that was primarily in U.S. banks and insurance companies, which were totally bombed out, and some retail structured products, which are too too uh, maybe too lengthy a discussion for today, um, and and some gold and some uh, some precious metal stocks. Yeah, Dave, can you talk to us about what is Dave Lotan's ideal 
junior mining investment, just like a general profile. And you can give specific examples if you would like to. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, 2008, I think reinforced my own view that the most important things to monitor in, in investing are flow of funds and psychology. And I watched all kinds of AAA assets or assets that were supposedly AAA uh, that had leverage on them uh, go from 100 cents on the dollar to 5 cents on the dollar during that period. And it was because many of those trades had been put on with enormous amounts of borrowed money and that credit was not available. So there was just no one to buy. And these assets, which had fantastic returns and were certainly going to pay par in a couple of years, there just wasn't there just wasn't enough capital to reinitiate those trades at other places. So they just they just dropped precipitously and, and hit absurd values. So above all else, if the flow of funds into whatever you're investing in are negative, you're not going to win. This is not going to happen. And the second thing that is important, of course, in my mind, and I run a behavioral model for investing, is psychology. And the perception, uh, perception is incredibly crucial in junior mining. Um, and when investors think that it's not going to work, that the market is never going to supply capital uh, to a company to, to move its projects forward, uh, it can trade for, for zero, despite having a tremendous amount of asset value. So um, I, I really want to get... I really, I really, I really want to get in front of of an asset class where I think the fund flows are going to go from negative to neutral or positive, and you really get well paid when perception changes, when psychology changes. And um, perhaps I can give you an example. Yes, please. Sure. So, um, Foran Mining uh, is uh, is a uh, it's a BMS deposit. Uh, in uh, Saskatchewan, uh, it's bigger than average, about 35 million tons, slightly lower grade than you'd expect for a BMS deposit, and uh, has been around for many, many years. It, it, I think, probably hit eight or 15 cents at one point. And um, last November, Dan Meyerson was announced as the new executive chairman of Foran. And Dan had been at Glencore. Uh, Glencore had the marketing rights for the Ferran deposit. Um, and uh, Dan put, I think, 700000 of a million in. Darren Morecambe, uh, the, uh, the CEO, put three hundred in. And Darren was, oh, sorry, uh, um, and Dan was granted $6 million options at 20 cents. Now, uh, I bald the story for many years. I wasn't super interested in it. VMS never had much of an audience uh, in the investing world. Uh, once, once copper porphyries became the dominant form of investment for major mining companies. But I knew that Pierre Lassonde was close to a 10% holder in the stock, and I knew that David Harkwell owned a lot of the stock, and it seemed impossible to me that Dan would get $6 million options at $0.20 cents if Pierre had not bought in. And, uh, and it also seemed obvious to me that the Glencore marketing rights, which were handicapping the value of the, of the deposit, must have been defaulted on if a fellow from Glencore was willing to leave the company to, to, to go on and be the executive chairman. So I called one of our mutual friends that day, Martin Katzberg, and chatted with him about it and talked to a lot of people about, about the idea. Uh, it traded probably at 20 to 30 cents for a couple of weeks. It's a $2 stock today. Prem Watts have put $100 million in uh, at Fairfax. And uh, it, it, is, uh, it is now the darling of ESG investors. It's going to produce clean copper with no arsenic, with abundant hydropower and harmony with the local community. And, uh, and the, it's, it's, it's up to NX. So what changed? Perception? Nothing. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So this is a very, very powerful thing. And I've seen it happen over and over again in this business, uh, but that's a great example. Nothing really changed with the asset. Uh, a really smart young guy who I had known and had a lot of respect for left Glencore and became the executive chairman. And they've had a couple of good drill results since then, but Dan just started spreading the word around and he's a well-known guy. And 
in Australia. Uh, he ran Base Core for Glencore for a while, which was operated out of Canada. And uh, and people just sit up, sit, sat up and, and, and took notice smiling. And so I thought it was a stunning investment opportunity, and I'm grateful to to Dan for for having for having uh, for having decided to go there. And it, it, it's been extremely uh, good for my portfolio. But uh, it, it illustrates this, and I could talk to you about ten other companies where this happened. Arena Minerals, uh, lithium in Argentina, which was a two cent stock last year, and finally, after many years, got a deal done with Gang Feng to take this new method of processing lithium. Uh, and you use it on some of these Argent- Argentina brines. It's a 23 cent stock today. It's up 10 times. Nothing changed. Well, I shouldn't say that. Gan Feng made, a, made an investment in Lithium Americas, recently took, I think, 10% of the company. Um, but they had the technology, they had the story. I knew Will Randall, I knew Simon Marcotte. Uh, and, uh, and these aren't even discovery stories. I mean, the, the things that get everybody excited about the junior markets are, are Arequipa, you know, making discoveries in on a mountainside in Peru or, or uh, Calpine or a consolidated stikeen drilling 200 meters of an ounce at Eskay Creek out of nowhere. Um, but uh, the junior markets are full of really interesting stories where companies will go up 10 times merely because the psychology changes. FPX Nickel is developing the large-scale Dakar Nickel District in central British Columbia. Within the district is FPX Nickel's PEA stage Baptiste Nickel Deposit, which is projected to be among the world's top 10 largest nickel mines by annual output. The Baptiste Deposit has the potential for the lowest quartile operating costs at just $2.74 per pound. And compared to recent global nickel mines, the project requires a low capex. FPX is also commencing its first ever drill program at its van target in the Dakar Nickel District. Surface samples have indicated that the van target footprint is larger in scale and 10 to 15% higher in grade than Baptiste. FPX Nickel trades in Canada as FPX and on the OTC under FPOCF. To learn more, go to fpxnickel.com. That's fpxnickel.com. And do you think the best place to find those type of 10 baggers are what you described? When there is a resource outlined and maybe there's even some infrastructure, there could be hundreds of millions of dollars of sunk costs that are there, but for whatever reason, perception and sentiment is is down towards the project. And then when strategic people like yourself and others come in, it's almost like there's awareness that comes with that and the re-rating that comes with that. Is that the safest place for someone like you or some of my listeners, retail listeners, um, f- to invest? Well, I think uh, that that's true. And I would add that uh, Foran first came to my notice probably 10 years ago when Pierre went over 10% on a financing uh, at 50 cents. So uh, you would have been waiting a very long time if you bought it based on Pierre Lasson closology. Um, so that's just one example uh, and a great example and a recent example of where a change in psychology changed the value of the company dramatically without any major changes happening to the asset. Um, and and it it's a great example of, of of what I think is the best opportunity and resources, which is to get in front of these perception changes. But I think one of the best opportunities was in January of 2016 when the venture was at a 50-year low, trading at something like uh, 470. Uh, and it didn't for me, and I was heavily invested already at that point in time and bleeding out of every artery. Uh, but it seemed to me that that didn't square with the fact that probably two thirds of the great deposits being mined at the time had been found by junior companies. And the junior markets are themselves a giant science experiment. Uh, put more crassly, it's a thousand monkeys at a thousand typewriters. Uh, and one of, them's gonna, one of them is gonna produce a beautiful, beautiful novel. Did you create that analogy? I've never heard that before. No, no, no. Okay. I, I, I stole that one. Okay. Uh, but uh, but uh, it's uh, so it's uh, it's a it's a you know one of the reasons that uh, major mining companies give money to juniors is uh, is because if you take a portfolio approach to it, um, you have a much better chance of making a discovery. Uh, than you would simply running your own exploration business. So there are many companies uh, 
Well, many CEOs, some of them are in the business still, some of them are, are out, but Dave Garofalo was a great example of, of a CEO who believed that the best way to make discoveries was to give money to junior companies uh, and to junior companies that might be in the process of making a discovery. And there are uh, many possible exits uh, when you invest in the stock of a junior. Sometimes it looks awful. I mean, if you look at uh, investments in uh, Bellow Sun, for instance, which happened from a couple of mining companies, uh, it, it didn't appear to end well. Uh, but the fact of the matter is uh, juniors can take risks that seniors can't. For, uh, for, uh, for every single person that a junior company sends out to prospect in the bush, a senior company would need three. Uh, they would never send anyone out unaccompanied, uh, and they would ensure that there was somebody between uh, those two uh, explorers uh, and civilization in order to make sure that if they could only make it halfway back, that there was something safe for them. They would need to buy insurance uh, in case uh, one of those people was injured or created a forest fire because they have all kinds of capital and retained earnings to protect. So juniors probably get uh, three times as much expiration done for every dollar uh, versus uh, the expiration or the, the work that a major gets done. And many juniors uh, don't spend money on expiration. So uh, there, there is an irony there. Uh, major gives money to a junior and they spend it all on promotion. And uh, what does Rick say? Uh, slow horses and fast women. Yes. Um, and Rick likes to see 85% in the ground. Although he told me recently, I believe it goes down to 80 just with the way things are. Would that be what you would expect to from the money they raise? A hundred percent. Yeah, okay. absolutely. And there are, so despite, uh, the, uh, despite the, uh, the scandal and scorn that the industry needs to heap on itself by allowing bad actors, uh, to raise capital, there are many good companies, uh, run by people who want to make discoveries and who, uh, and and who and who want to improve their situations in life by doing so, uh, and uh, and when you give a dollar to one of those uh, actors, you get three times as much work done as you would at the major level. In your portfolio, what percentage would be explorers? And if I understand where you invest in exploration companies, it comes down to people for you, doesn't it? You have to know the people and trust the people, and you start there. Would that be accurate? For exploration companies, uh, that's critical. Uh, every well, let's just talk about how you build a great junior company. Um, there are are many formulas, but the one that I think that succeeds the most on average is you need a very good scientist, you need a very good salesman, and you need a good capital allocator or strategist. And the three S's. Very, Right. Yes. In very limited circumstances, that person or those roles can be played by a single individual. And I would say that Andre Gomond is the greatest example uh, that I have seen of that in, in recent times. And if anyone remembers Virginia Gold and the Eleanor Discovery, uh, it's a textbook for how companies are best run. Uh, Andre was a great geologist, but he was also he also had a financial background. He was a sneaky, sneaky good promoter, uh, and uh, and he thought long and hard before he put the business's capital at risk. I think he'd done seventy five joint ventures before they found the boulder that eventually was traced six kilometers back to the Eleanor discovery. And uh, when he finally went to bid with Gold Corp, he only had twenty eight million shares outstanding. So it wasn't a huge value, maybe $600 million, but you got $10 a share on the day. And then Gold Corp stock went up between the time they announced the acquisition and the close. So you got $14. And then you got a stub company or a half a share in a stub company, which went to $14 when a Cisco Gold uh, royalty took it over, I think, eight years later. Uh, this is stunning return profile in my mind, especially in relation to the amount of risk that you as an investor had to take under Andre's prudent stewardship. So in that case, he had a great scientist, he was a great salesman, and he was really, really thoughtful about where and how he took risk with capital. So uh, in, in uh, most junior companies, you don't have all three. Uh, many of them have a great scientist uh, and, uh, and no salesman. 
uh, and no one to think about when money should be raised and when money shouldn't be raised and when money should be spent and when it should be conserved. Uh, and those companies can be very dangerous. Um, if you add a good advocate in, uh, then com those companies will raise money at better prices, but you still need someone in the business uh, to put the brakes on when capital is going to be difficult to raise and to decide to go and raise capital uh, when perhaps uh, markets are froth. And would you be such an advocate that you're referring to? Well, I'm not a salesman. Um, in fact, uh, Orion, which is a, an example of, of, of a company that was run by a great scientist, was completely and totally without a salesman. The, the CEO at the time, I thought, was also actually a pretty good capital allocator. Uh, the, the prospect generator model is uh, not sexy, but it does allow you to conserve your capital and always gives you the option to pivot to sole risk ex exploration if you find something valuable. So in that case, you had a, a, good, a good strategy, a good risk management ethos for the company. You had a great scientist, but you had no salesman. So I put a salesman in. Uh, it didn't work. And then I, I, uh, I provided the company with some very compassionate emergency financing uh, and, uh, and probably over time assumed the role of strategist or, or capital out. Or you just kind of fell into it then, right? You don't go into an investment looking for that role. I do not. No, I don't. Uh, it's not, it isn't wise to go over 10% and it isn't wise to join boards. Um, but it seemed to me, and I, I obviously we're not here to talk about companies I'm involved with, but it seemed to me in that case that the opportunity was extraordinary enough that it wasn't the wrong thing to lock up and to give the company some assistance in the way that it financed uh, the, the discovery. Um, that you could safely play a long game, uh, and uh, and the chances of what it had being bought by a major were higher than normal, and 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 it, it would be okay. And again, I'm I I don't know what the outcome will be, but uh, I I remain convinced it was the right thing for me to do to lock my stock up and and uh, and and take a role on in the company that that no one else uh, was available for. And you didn't even sell any of your stock at much higher valuations uh, with this company too, right? I did not. No, no. In fact, I've only added over the years. Uh, and, um, and I, you know, um, good exploration stories are a race between the shares outstanding and the drill bit. And the one thing that you can control is the shares outstanding. You can't control necessarily uh, what's going to come out of the ground, especially in exploration stories. And I guess the other thing I'd say is I think it's extremely important with exploration stories not to let them go too far up the Lassonde curve. And what I mean by that is uh, if you go to resource too early, if you're too, too eager to, to drill out a resource rather than to continue to look for other discoveries on the property or to expand the blue sky, uh, you, you, uh, you get yourself right to the peak of, of, of the Lausanne curve. And we all know what's on the other side of that, that long orphan period where you're doing feasibility studies and permitting and perhaps having to bluff the market that you're going to build a mine yourself. So uh, bottom line, my view is keep exploring. If you have a great property and a big property, uh, don't stop with the first thing you find. It might not be the biggest thing you find. So in that way, you can keep yourself down at the base of the discovery process in that, in that well-known curve, rather than letting yourself go up to, uh, to that first precipitous peak, uh, which unfortunately is statistically most often followed by a long trough. So Dave, when you go over 10% uh, on an exploration company, then your exit strategy is to find a major to buy the company? Would, would that be accurate? Because you can't just unload millions of shares into the open market. Correct. Correct. Yeah. I, I wouldn't go over 10% if I didn't think that the company had something that would be of interest to a major producer. And in, in the case of Orion, obviously, both Ken Ross and Newmont are investors and, and Agnico is an investor in the next door neighbor. And it's a brand new gold camp that has received very little exploration. So all those in 
all, all those factors suggest that it is more possible, for instance, in the case of people in that area, that, that the, you know, they're, they're, Igniko is the only one in the country. So I'm not saying it's going to happen. And again, I don't know the outcome, uh, but uh, the probabilities, the ing- there are ingredients present in the story that are not present in 90% of other juniors. And uh, all of this makes me willing to take the risk. Would you be willing to share perhaps one of your failed mining investments and give us a little autopsy for the sake of learning? <laughs> oh, there are so many. <laughs> Let me think about that. Um, well, uh, let's talk about something that's failed that uh, at least in the, in the medium term uh, that, uh, that I still have some optimism for. So a couple of years ago, I was captured on video at one of the metals investment forums uh, in the at the bar session with Brent and Ira Thomas and, uh, and a few others. And, and uh, it was, I think it was January of 2016. I think it was. And uh, Brent asked me to answer a couple of questions as a supposedly successful investor in the space. And he said, so, you know, what, what do you, what do you think about um, the market? And, you know, what, what, what do you think, where would you invest now? I said, well, with a venture at 470, throw a dart. And if the dart doesn't land on Mirasol, buy Mirasol. And uh, Mirasol, I think was probably 90 or 80 cents at the time. And it did go to $3, but Unfortunately, it collapsed uh, under the weight of an inter Nissan feud between the management and uh, the capital providers. And uh, it's 25% owned by John Tognetti and the guy running the company at the time, Steve Nano, is, you know, they're both good friends of mine. Uh, and Steve's private company, Global Ore, was selling services to Mirasol. So you had a situation where the public company was run by the same guy who's running a private company that was selling services in. And uh, I didn't think that, that that conflict of interest was healthy. And I wasn't certain that it wouldn't result in some differences of opinion over time. And, and uh, fast forward, Steve's out. Uh, they had another CEO in for a while and uh, that didn't work. And uh, it's a 35 cent stock. And, and, you know, I still think it's got a fantastic portfolio, albeit much of it in Argentina, which is a difficult jurisdiction to operate in. Uh, some very good stuff in Chile as well, and some fantastic joint ventures there. Uh, but it's a dead story. And uh, still has 10 million bucks in the bank, still only has 55 million shares outstanding. Structure is crucial in these instances, but um, it... Uh, it was a uh, victim to that classic battle between labor and capital. And, uh, and uh, it didn't, uh, it didn't uh, from a share price perspective, perform as we had all hoped, uh, uh, as uh, it lost its, uh, its guiding geological light. And, and it's, it's a little lost right now. I, I, as I said, still think that there's Lots of prospectivity in the company, but it's a great example of, of an investment that I probably held longer than I should have. Dave, you're a, you're a chairman of a junior, um, Orion, like you said, and I get feedback from retail listeners. Sometimes it's in the YouTube comments or maybe an email. And oftentimes the sentiment expressed to me is, Bill, we don't feel like junior management or directors have our best interests in mind as the little guy and invest in $3,000, $10,000, $15,000 in a company. And then, um, you know, they don't feel like they can succeed. They're not accredited. They don't have the connections. From your perspective, you're, you're just being frank with us. Do you think the little guy, the retail investor at home with his computer and his investing app on his phone and YouTube, and so maybe a podcast like this, could they be successful in this sector? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, I bought uh, 80% of the stock that I own. I own, I own interest in, let's say, 75 different companies. Uh, and I bought 80% of those shares in a secondary market. Uh, and I remember well being uh, in Zurich in April of 2016. Uh, and at that point in time, uh, the market had, had a, a violent and positive <laughs> change in direction. Uh, one that I couldn't even believe after years of uh, painful losses in stocks that I had no control or no input into um, that whole portfolio had turned green for me. Uh, 
in only a matter of months. It all turned on about January the 20th of 2016. And those are stocks I bought in the secondary market. And I was, uh, was at the bar uh, chatting with Darren Blasuti, a good friend of mine who runs America's Gold and Silver. And a banker came over and uh, said, yeah, who are you? And I said, well, I'm, you know, Darren and I are just friends. He said, what do you do? I said, well, I trade, uh, I'm sort of a secondary market maker. You know, I, uh, I guess that's, that's probably a, a little bit dishonest. I've just been buying stocks for years because, of course, there are no trading opportunities, only the opportunity to pay less every day for something you paid more for the day before. <laughs> and the fellow just laughed at me and said, yeah, that's, that's just never going to work. You know, I mean, I've talked to Rick Rule. The only thing you, you should do in this market is participate in private placements uh, and get, get warrants. Uh, and uh, I said, okay, well, noted. Thanks for the advice. Uh, and I had come to observe over the years that if you waited for private placements with full five-year warrants, um, you might get something valuable, uh, but you were equally likely to get management teams who had capitulated, given away the company uh, at too low of a price, uh, not been able to delay their gratification uh, and sought comfort over the tension of running a business successfully and taking risk and moving things, things forward. So lots of those warrants ended up being zeros in my view. And I wanted to invest in companies that didn't give away five-year warrants. Uh, and I wanted to invest in the stocks companies that, that didn't come to market during, during the great bear. Uh, and, uh, and certainly put my money where my mouth was with Orion. You know, we, there was no way that the company had no money. So I just loaned it money. Uh, well, the CEO and I loaned the company money for for um, almost two years when it would have been imprudent to issue stock and when a warrant would have been required. Uh, and, you know, Mike wasn't just a great geologist, but he was disciplined and he was capable of saying no to people who offered him money at 10 and 15 cents with a full warrant and trusting that if we just held the line, we could get him a better outcome. And so uh, it was, uh, it, it, it's, a, it's extremely uh, important uh, in my view uh, to think about that, that part of the business. And I'm sorry, that's probably not the question you asked. But, no, but uh, you gave an example. I think you answered the question and the answer is yes. If you, with, with your knowledge base and connections are buying 80% of your positions in the open market, then surely the smaller guy with $10,000 can succeed. But it all comes down to, being successful with that knowledge arbitrage, right? Seeing 100%. things that other people do not see, understanding what you're investing in, knowing the risks and the reward, and and seeing the upcoming catalysts. And yeah. would you would you agree that the first thing to get right is getting the macro story right? I've heard Eric Sprott say that that you start with the macro tailwinds. You got to have those working in your favor. A hundred percent. And and as. Uh... As an investor who was strapped to a chair for years and waterboarded by the outward flow of funds in the business, I can tell you that just nothing works if you get the flow of funds wrong. And that's the most important part of the macro context. And I mean, there are so many brokers uh, that are now gone. Uh, Wellington West, Wolverton, Westwind, Jordan Capital, Research Capital. Uh, GMP is only a shadow of its former self. Uh, and, and, uh, it was, um, obvious, I think just a little bit too late in, let's say 2013, 2014, that the whole industry was, uh, packing up shop capital was being withdrawn, not just from investments in extractive companies, but in brokering and selling and having businesses that communicated about these investments. And, uh, and so uh, when the plumbing and the bricks and mortar go away, uh, it's very, very difficult for these kinds of investments to catch a bid. And all of that ends up being counterbalanced when the sector gets cheap enough that only a tiny amount of incoming capital can create performance, but you've got to get that macro right. And, uh, you know, I don't know, will, will anyone ever, will there ever be another Wellington West? 
uh, or, or West Wind or Jordan Capital. It's, it's, it's hard to know the, the, the business of becoming a broker. Jennings Capital, another, another great example. The business of becoming a broker and, and the seven and seven model. Uh, it, 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 it really, really got deeply impaired during the bear market from 2011 to 2015 and, and has barely even begun uh, to be reassembled. And, and I think that's very positive. That's all in our future. Um, and for listeners really, really that don't know what you mean when you say seven and seven, that's a 7% commission and 7% finders warrants for capital raised, right? Yeah, correct. There were a bunch of shops in, in Toronto uh, that, that didn't have retail clients. They just had a fleet of salesmen who uh, helped raise uh, money for, for investment companies by going to institutions. They would get seven and seven. And the minute transaction flow dried up in those businesses, they were gone. They, 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 their revenue went to zero and you had back offices and sales staff and office leases and many salesmen released into the wild. Mm. Well, Dave, you, you've been so gracious to give up your time today. I really appreciate that. Kind of as we wrap it up, could you talk to us about the commodities you're most bullish on, those macro stories and fundamentals uh, in the commodity space that you're most bullish on? Well, I'm always b- bullish gold, uh, but I think that uh, the gold market uh, is very difficult to predict. Uh, and while I'm confident that it'll be higher in 20 years or 10 years or five years, I'm never certain about how it will perform in the next year or maybe even the next two years. Um, but I can't see a future uh, without inflation. Uh, too much debt was taken on during COVID, and it's going to be important uh, for for monetization. is going to become a a common feature in all these large economies, and and you can't see it now because everyone's doing it. Uh, but uh, especially the economies that aren't closed, you know, where they there's there are vital agricultural or or energy inputs that come from abroad, like Turkey. Well, you see the problems writ large there. The lira has been completely destroyed, but. America, the United, you know, America, Canada, we, we can supply our own food and energy. So we haven't really been hit uh, as a result of the expansion of our money supplies, but it will, it will become obvious, I think, in the gold price over, over time. Um, and then I guess if I had to pick something else, I'd say that all the battery metals, all the electrification metals like copper uh, and lithium and cobalt and uh, nickel are going to, uh, we have a very bullish outlook in, in, in those metals as well. And then when you move into the bulks, iron ore, mm, hard to predict. Metallurgical coal, I think, is a fantastic opportunity right now. The phosphates? Rarers, I don't Are know you so still much. into phosphates? <laughs> I still own 10% of, or almost 10% of Box River. And, uh, and I think that phosphate is, is, is one of those commodities, especially igneous phosphate. Uh, that has a glorious future, uh, but I, I don't know when. Um, so, no, I'll invest across the spectrum. I think that hard assets, uh, it's, there's a very positive outlook for all hard assets in a world where mon- uh, money supplies are being infl- in, in, inflated globally. So I guess I guess that's sort of a cop-out answer, but uh, I'm, I'm and, and, and frankly, I'm bullish oil. To be honest with you, I think that so much capital uh, has been uh, capital investment has been stifled by the environmental lobby. I don't think there's a bridge to renewables, and I think that uh, there'll be bottlenecks in the energy supply chain that will probably take oil to two hundred dollars and gas to some absurd prices as well. So it's probably a good time to be a commodity investor. It doesn't necessarily mean things are going to be socially. Um, serene, uh, but uh, I'm bullish on our sector. Yes. Well, Dave, thank you for your time. I always give my guests an opportunity to share how people can follow them. But my understanding is you don't necessarily want to be filed. You like to keep a lower profile, don't you? I have nothing to sell, Bill. (laughs) But thank you. But but you are the non-executive chairman. So perhaps share your company um, website. Sure. Sure. I'm chairman of Orion Resources. uh, And I I'm not quite sure. I think it's orionresources.ca. Uh, it's a high risk exploration company in gold and probably not for everyone, but it's for me. Yep. And I'll put the link in the website to that. 
Dave, really appreciate your time. Thank you for contributing to me and my audience today. Many thanks for all the great work you're doing, Bill. I really enjoy it. And I think it's, uh, it's a sector where uh, passionate, uh, passionate investors who, who want to do service by informing others uh, can make a big difference. And I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.